slightly focus on the water. Well, we Hi. do it again. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? I feel like I need to give you a hug or something because you made it into the film. Oh, I did into the film. It was a nice yes. surprise. I was watching it here at, at, late at night and I'm watching like, what the fuck? It was like a young me and then I thought I wasn't, I was, maybe was I hallucinating? Yeah, I was like, wow, a Greek person made it into the film. That, thank God forbid. Yeah, God the first forbid. one. The first one. And then obviously Roman Gavraz, who made the Born Free video, was yeah. the second Greek person. So you've yeah. had a couple of us. Couple Greeks represented in the film. The, yeah. the idea, to, the, the decision to let a film come out, see, because you've gone through so much in your life and you've gone through so much in your career, whatever you do next, you can kind of now make that the narrative. When you put out a film with your whole life and the ups and the downs, now all that stuff's back on the table again. <laughs> like you get, you have to relive all of that. Yes. Did you want to do that? No. No. But you said, let's make a film, I suppose. No, I wanted to make a tour film. Okay. Because <clears throat> I guess the last interview we did for the Maya record, people really misunderstood that record. But I think creatively I put a lot of stuff into it, you know. And I wanted to document that, and that's originally what the film was going to be about, that phase. Because there was so much uh, misunderstanding and my fans really, like, got it. And then historically, you know, after the Maya record, so many events have happened in the world that shaped the direction of the world we you know, we live in today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never got to really go back and talk about that, you know. So I wanted to make a documentary really about that Maya digital internet kind of world. Yeah. You have a lot of footage. And this is something completely different. Yeah. You know. Like this becomes a... Yeah. This is, an, this is your you. Yeah, it's kind of weird though. You know, it is, it is, but it's never going to be 100% like me. And because uh, obviously I would have seen certain things differently, you know. But it's still, yeah, it's me in, in the sense that it was documented by me yeah. or, in real time as stuff was happening. From way before this career. That's what yes. was incredible, this, this footage you have. Because I guess you set out to be a filmmaker or a storyteller or a journalist, right? So you have all this incredible co collection. Like, how, how many hundreds of hours did the director have to go through? I think he said about a thousand hours. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> 700 <laughs> shot by me. <laughs> and then he had 300 from archives and, you know, like right. interviews and shows and things that other people sent in. And, uh, yeah. So a thousand hours he spent watching it. Are you, are you a nervous person, generally? Are you anxious? About what? Just are you, in general, do you think? Mm, no. So then when you set the stage for me, what it's like when you finally have to sit down and watch the cut? Well, I was already, like, prepared for it to be a sting job, you know, because obviously the fact that I couldn't get into New York and the film got made in New York and the political climate in New York had got to this intense situation and obviously we were talking about diversity and diversity is quite a limited you know yeah depending on the country diversity means like it, it means a totally different thing yeah. and and i was not happy in the way that it was it what diversity meant in america in 2017 or 18 so i was not i, I was you know definitely not holding my breath thinking you know it's i i had already prepared myself to fight the fight for it being a sting job film to take me down. You but know. it's your friend who made it, so how much of a sting job film did, like, really? Well, really, I mean, my friend is, a, is not like me. You know, he's a nice guy, and he, he's very, like, quite passive, you know? Like, I was the confident, chatty, shouty one, and, you know, and I think, <clears throat> I thought if he'd went to New York and they'd isolated him, he'd give in very quickly, you know? Oh, that's an interesting place. And, and it, and it, and it, and he was in New York, and he was isolated, and I was, I didn't have the visa to go there, to see what was happening. So why, why would that be the scenario? Like, I'm curious as to how, like, what was going on in your head? What did you talk to him at all? Was he? T no, I mean, we lost contact, and at that time, Laura Poitras yeah. had put out Risk, and. You know, all these filmmakers, documentary filmmakers who were supposed to represent truth and journalism were suddenly turning to side with the establishment. 
and doing whatever to save their own necks. And I felt like, oh, this is like that situation. You know, Steve's going to get a Bentley and a, a mansion out of it and, you know, be like given a green card maybe to work in America forever. And the thing he has to give is basically, you know, my footage over, which is kind of, you know, it's my, it's my life. And the film isn't that, though. It's not a sting. It's not a sting, yeah. And it's weird. When I saw it, that's, that's why I was a bit shocked. Is he going to be hurt when he hears you say stuff like no, this? No, I say that to his face all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we know the world we live in. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, that's just how it goes. So, but when I watched it, I was really pleasantly surprised that he stuck to his guns and you know, for the fight to keep it very, you know, he just kept it very to the point, you know. Was he pressured? To, to do what? To do something different? What, from who? Well, you said that when he had stuck to his guns and I wondered if he... Oh, yeah, I, I, I think, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, he said yesterday in the uh, screening that uh, the editors... Uh, that he'd, because it took seven years to make, and he'd gone through like 35 different editors, and everybody wanted to cut a film where it was a, a, a young girl looking for her identity because she had like lost daddy syndrome, and that's that's like what the whole film is about. It's this like psychological thing with her and her father and all this, and Steve was like, I know Maya, like that's definitely not the issue. It's and also so insulting, but. It, yeah, I know. And so I think depending on who was cut, uh, employed to come in, yeah. I, I'm sure there was like hundreds of suggestions about where to take it because there was so much content, you know. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's really interesting out of 1,000 hours. That's the 90 minute he's picked out. But obviously there could be like hundreds of different versions. Right. Like for me, even just creatively, that's not really covered at all. That That... You did, you know, the fact that I went to St. Martin's, uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't even have that thread what, what you did artistically, right. creatively, visually, you know, fashion-wise and all of these things which then became templates for many pop stars afterwards where America's, you know, like copied the template and made millions of dollars. It, and they don't give you credit because you're a Tamil woman, and it, that's not really, it's not, the film is not even about what it, you bring to the table creatively. Is that what you think as well? You know? Like, this is, she made this, by the way. You made this, right? Did you, like... No, this is a lining fabric to make si sari blouses, uh -huh. so you put it inside when you wear a, make a sari blouse. So, yeah, I had, I had a tailor on set in the desert when we shot Borders, and he made it, but obviously I designed it, and then he, he stitched it in the desert. It was really pretty awesome, Do in like two hours. And so you have this fashion, obviously, the things that you make. Do you, do you look at the Americans, or even around the world, who, who, who have built careers around this? Do you think, well, this is what I would do now? I could make my line. Could you make your own Yeezys? Yeah, but it's really interesting. Like, could I make my own Yeezys? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I could, I could, I could. But uh, it's always like this battle with me, you know, like uh, uh, at any given time I could do anything, like I could go off and... I used to say like 15 years ago that I would just, if I wanted to be a billionaire, I'd have like a toothpaste company or something and just work that out if I wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. But it was never about the money. And uh, yeah, so I think you you could do it. And if that's the that's what it takes to be recognized as somebody who's, you know, like nowadays I feel like musicians or artists don't really have to be creative in order to get a brand. You just need CEOs poached from other companies, put a team together and hire some other designer to do it, you know. Yeah. It's not like your thing. So that's that's really about CEO-ness, you know. 
But yeah, I, I quite like actually just making things out of necessity. Yeah. So this film comes out and you have this idea of telling the story of, of the record and that time in your life. And if it doesn't really do that extensively, you still have to tell that story then, don't you? To take people to that. You said that you thought that film, initially the idea was that this film was going to tell that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it didn't, yeah, yeah. you still have to answer, like you still have to say things. Um, yeah, I mean, I would love to put that error in context, you know, but I think we've come away from it so far now where people don't even care that we lost privacy and that our data gets sold and like that's the new oil and that's what people are doing to, you know, people are lining up to give their selfies away all day long and their content away and you know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't even know if that's, if that's even a film to make right now. Because well, with the Trump thing in Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, people are talking about data. Do you think it's just, do you think anything meaningful come of this? Or have we given up so much? Yeah, it's a really good question because, like, I wish I had this conversation, what, eight years ago in 210, because that is what the conversation was, right. to be like, this is going to happen to you. Like, you should be aware, you know? And I didn't want to, like, lead my fans down the alley where they just date, you know, they were just going to be collected and turned into zombie consumers, you know, and I felt that my fans were smarter than that. And it's better to not have fans correlated to one space where they could all be swallowed up. But then it happened anyway, you know, and now your fan is the fan of, you know, a manufactured pop artist and a fake thing, mm -hmm. and somebody who's an, I, imitating a real thing, somebody who was like completely, you know, was like from somebody who maybe came from X Factor. You know what I mean? There's no difference in Stan, Stan kind of culture. Like, Stan is just a Stan, and they, though they say, oh my God, Taylor Swift, Stans hate, like, blah, 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 Stans, and they try to keep, they try to make it a different thing. But it's all the same. But it's all pretty much the same. Like, everybody kind of thinks the same, you know. Well, the, and it's about numbers, and it's about the numbers game, and the likes game, and the blah, blah, you know. When that movie came out, Minions, and every, all the kids liked it, and all these kids were wearing the Minion costumes around, and <clears throat> I was sitting back thinking, they're Minions. Like, they're creating Minions. They're actually making them proud of being Minions. I know they're just kids, but... The parents are looking at these kids saying, we're making minions, and that's all they wanted was people to get, and I go to shopping malls and I see a tiny sh gro a grocery cart that says future customer on it, so the kid can feel like they're doing what daddy or mommy does. I'm like, we're making future customers, yeah. not future revolutionaries, not future artists, yeah, yeah, not yeah, future yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Future customers. Well, it's really interesting, because a hundred, I was, I was reading that in, in Japan, uh, they had, like, the, their kings back in the day, uh, before America went and made the treaty with Japan to bring um, uh, trade to Japan. Before that, the kings always banned uh, merchants being I an important person in society. So they had a rung where merchants couldn't go past a certain level. and because for the first time they'd become super wealthy and they started becoming wealthier than the royalty, you know, and they started having a lot of power and they were lending money, da, da, da. So the Japanese culture said, no, this is going to be terrible if merchants had loads of power because they, they kind of just go with whatever, you know, is going to make the most money and our culture can't be preserved in that way. And um, then I guess in the... Um, uh, I can't remember exactly what date, but when the trade was built between America and Japan, uh, that changed. And actually, it's all over the world, it's the same. Like, con you know, consumers are a thing because our merchants are the rulers of the world. Like, Mr. Amazon yeah. is bigger than, you know, the American government. And that's the world we live in now, you know. And it's kind of interesting to, to be like, okay, what is it then? You know, yeah, you're right. Maybe it is about you just selling stuff and making a clothing line or, you know. Well, I think, it's, I think it might be film because counterculture 
has found a home in a lot of independent film now, again, like it maybe would have 30, 40 years ago. And whereas music, all the stands have become one, and it's true, there's still a lot of great artists who are very conscious, but to break through is a little bit different than it was even when you were starting. But there's this documentary culture that exists now. The Netflix and chill, Hulu, however you consume, I see a lot more people watching a lot more documentaries than they used to. So I wonder if film is the place where you can... Yeah. It's an interesting time for film because everybody can film. Yeah. And everyone's got a camera. That's why I was telling the kids yesterday, I was like, you don't get it. Like, this film also goes through the decades of like technological change, you yeah. know, so you start with this big fat VHS and then it's like a high A, then it's a mini DV and then you get your first like digital chip yeah. and an SD card and then a computer iChat and then a phone and then a flip cam and you kind of go through the errors. And I was like, you don't understand, like, what I had to do to get that camera for 10 days, for three, out of 365 days at school, at college, um, you were allowed to have the video camera for 10 days, right? Because they only had one, right. so everyone had to rotate it. <laughs> so when you got your turn, you had to just film everything, you know, and that's why my footage... I would film the things that I filmed at, for my films, but then I would also film my family, I would film the ants, I would film the thing and the flowers, you know, just people down the street, the old woman next door. So I filmed everything because I only had it for 10 days. Wow. Then I had to give it back, you know. So it was like this kind of thing because it was like gold dust getting hold of a camera when you're really poor, you know. And a digital camera at that time was like, I guess the same, 2,000 pounds, but 2,000 pounds was a lot of money, yeah. you know. But it's basic economics, right? Scarcity versus ubiquitous. So Yeah, so I'm like, you don't know like what a privileged situation you guys are in because you can't film everything, except everyone's just filming, like, selfies and, you know, mm -hmm. like, their food or tricks or whatever, you know. But <clears throat> we're not telling this other story, but... That's because we don't probably see there's anything wrong with the fact that we, we don't have privacy anymore. And, you know, and maybe that's... Uh, Is that the story of our time, the privacy thing? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I just said that. It's more than that. But it is you know, a huge story. It's more story. than that. Because it is a huge story. And the fact is, is many things. You know, we've, we've, we've got technological advancement, but our IQs have gone down. You know, our attention span is supposed to be like 12 seconds and a goldfish is six, you know. We've gotten, like, um, more consumery, I guess, and we don't... Uh, we don't seem to... Also, also, this culture of, like, we were talking about, you know, this, like, social media thing where people are very... Uh, People are very dismissive of like people, other people's experiences, you know, and, and sort of the, the continuity is what, we, you know. It's meme culture. Yeah, somebody it's like a, so fast. Somebody has a meaningful moment, some jackass puts a funny blurb underneath it, and then that funny blurb becomes the story, and it completely dismisses. It's meme culture. That's why I think it's the fucking end of us for that reason. Yeah, I think I think the story for now is actually bigger than that, which is um, like say the data mining thing, which is what it's all about right now. <clears throat> like with Cambridge Analytica and Zuckerberg and everything, you 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 think about the next step that everyone's like the next trillion dollar industry is AI, you know, and we're all going to like race to see who's got the best AI. Is it America? Is it China? And everyone's in on it and. Everyone's making their like versions. But the thing about AI is it feeds on the data that we give it, you know, and it's everything, everything. So the meme culture is going to be fed into it and the fake news is fed into it and the real news is fed into it and real, you know, like whatever people's information, uh, like educational stuff is fed into it. And then it's studying all your like crappy photos you're posting every day and it's like, you know, following how many steps you're taking. So all of this goes in to, to, to 
educate the AI. And I, I just feel like that just doesn't make sense. Like if you don't know how to edit truth and lies, you know, which brings us back to the Maya album, if you've got, if you've got a pool of knowledge and 50% is true and 50% is fake and you feed it into the AI, then it's 50% fake, 50% true. Right. And so how do you trust that the judgment of the AI is going to be based on the right things, you know? And yeah, I just don't see that going well. Because if you look at like the cycle of these things, it takes about four or five years, mm -hmm. you know, like Facebook to when it launches and it's like everybody connecting in the world and it's a cute little thing that's like finding friends to it turning into a sinister thing is not very long. No, not at you all. know, the period is like seven years or something. And same with like the WhatsApp guy quit this week, right? Because he's like, oh, our privacy is gone on yeah. there. And uh, so like the turnaround time of these things is so fast, five years. So if we go into AI, I reckon that it will always be optimistic and like cute and rosy in the beginning. And then it's going to turn sinister very quickly, given the time period of when these things, you know. And merchants will always find a way to make money. Exactly. Yeah. So like when greed and all that sort of steps in, it just gets like, blah, and you know. Do you, do you know what your role is? in this world now and what your role is as an artist and as a, as a person with a platform? Have you figured that out? Everyone keeps talking about my f platform, but they never talk about how my platform is censored. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking you about you your know? role. Do you think about what your role is and how I, you define it? I, I, I don't know because we're still in that conversation. Like, my everyone says you have a platform, but I, what do you mean by platform? Just well, I because know my that. records are like, like buried, you know, because of the labels issues with me, yeah. and it, sometimes they're personal, sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes it's just that I'm an outsider mm -hmm. that doesn't fit into the diversity in America, you know. And since I came out 15 years ago to now, the distribution outputs have gone tighter and tighter. Now that we've got option of two. Yeah. And if you piss both of them off, you're fucked, yeah. you know. And so all eyes are in the same position. But luckily, I'm the only, not luckily, maybe, unfortunately, I'm the only outside one, you know, that is, like, not, you know, not even like Adele, because she's obviously from England, but she's, she doesn't really have those issues but I think if you come from like talking about some other crazy thing mm -hmm. like from Sri Lanka and and you know you're specifically a Tamil who is like confusing to yeah. the West. They don't understand your your father's role and what that means. Yeah and that. I think I think all of these and and that your politics is coming from a real place and that that's like just it was in real time mm -hmm. you know and that that it was important to make political music or whatever the thing is, you know, all that all that is just not not digestible. So yeah, if you have a problem with distribution because you're outside of the acceptableness, then um, what is the platform? Like, what is really the platform that I've got? You know, and. So you, if I want it, if I want it to be bigger, then I have to kind of say nothing. Right. You know? Which I don't think you really need it to be bigger, right? Or want it to be bigger at that on the, at that cost. Uh, no, it would never be bigger at that cost. Right. You know, I, I think. But even though now they're like, you can say what you want, and that's what it's all about. And to me, I really, I feel like that would be a fight. You know, because. I might have to make uh, an anti-Trump record, but if I make an anti-anything else record, it's not gonna it's not gonna wash, you know. Yeah. Like even I don't know the concept of I feel like even even talking about the concept of uh, a worldly place where 
uh, diversity is about many countries and many identities and feminism, say if you take feminism, discussing that within the context of feminism, I find already difficult, you know, because it's easy for me to go and play that card and be like, oh my God, I'm so down for equal pay in Hollywood. And, you know, like how, how, long, how much longer we have to queue in a queue for a Starbucks coffee versus, you know, a man or whatever and <clears throat> discuss it within the Western context. But if I really talk about, well, what about um, the Tamil women only eight years ago were wearing uniforms and, you know, actually like eating cyanide pills because they didn't want to be raped by the Sri Lankan army and not a single rape or, um, you know, assault has been convicted in Sri Lanka and the women were driven to fight, you know, and these women like ran their own um, courthouses and police stations and looked after women in the community. And like the Tigers had equality and they set up the women to govern the women. And to me, so, so like feminism is just a broader concept, you know, and that only happened eight years ago. So it's not like I'm just gonna forget and be like, oh my God, yeah, it's all about you know, this thing over here and feminism has to fit within this context and I'm not never going to question this bit or talk about this bit because it's just complicated and it's a bit like, ooh, taboo. Yeah. It's like, no, I, I know that both of these extremes of women exist, you know, where here's women fighting for the right to be nude or wear a bikini and Instagram, you know, their butt and here is a woman who puts on a uniform and has to go out and fight, you know, because a hundred women got raped in their village, you know, and that's just as real to me as a woman, you know. So I find that very difficult because I haven't had that space to say something like that on social media mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, even. Because if you could put it out there, but if you did, it, it just gets more censored, yeah. you know. My social, like my Twitter's been frozen and my Instagram's frozen, and from from Twitter and and, and Facebook, they're they're censoring it. They, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They it's been it's been blocked for like yeah. uh, a year now, and uh, that's insane. Yeah, so I'm just like, you know, <laughs> how much do I believe in all this like other sort of stuff that pops up, you know, like. Um, Why are they doing that to you? I don't know. That, that's why I'm, we're talking about it in terms yeah. of what a platform, what kind of platform I... I feel like at this point I have to make a platform. Well, you, you, know? could, you could make a record. You could give it to me. We're not blocked yet. We'll put it out. All of our other friends will share it on their social media. So over time, they'll have to block a lot of us to stop your record from coming out. Maybe that's the new platform. Is actually what it was meant to be, which is a network where everybody cr created these brands for themselves, but really it works better when we're all sharing shit so they can't shut us down. Well, that was, that was what is in the documentary about Napster, yeah. you know, <clears throat> because in the beginning they were like, oh, you can't put your record in HMV and Tower Records because we don't know what genre you are. Yeah. Yet 15 years later, everyone's like, your genre is this and your culture appropriating and you, you are this thing. And it's like, no, for 15 years I had to fight the battle where I didn't have a genre and <clears throat> that became my genre, that I was a mashup of many genres, you know, and that is the refugee cultural identity and actually is quite a, a modern concept of many of us that are a mixture of lots of different things and it's the way we listen to music and it's the way that computers even are built, like the handset you have is programmed by somebody in Asia and the mineral came from Africa and the button was made in China and the cover got made in, you know, Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And everything we use is like that. You know, you wake up and you drink a coffee, the cup comes from somewhere and the fork comes from somewhere and the table's made somewhere, you know. And, <clears throat> and it's like, it's completely against what is being preached on social media now, which is like white people talk about white people, black people talk about black people. If you're anybody else, just fuck off, mm -hmm. you know? And unfortunately, yes, the music industry is divided in these two. Yeah, and certainly in, in, you know, in North America, it, it is, is, is it like that in Europe as well? 
the, the way I mean, there is no such thing right. in Europe anymore. We don't have a music industry. We're owned by American music industry. Right. Like, if you make records in Europe, you have to put it out in America on Apple or Spotify or Spotify or whatever the distribution thing is. You know, that's just where the tech companies are. And um, their Spotify isn't. No, but it's still it's based, it's still set there. Yeah. Yeah, still set there. So this idea. So that yeah. So I think there's no such thing. Like XL is a mainstream label now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they're signed to like da da da, and it's like it's no longer an indie label that it was 15 years ago. What was it like when you first walked into XL? Ah, uh, pretty amazing. They gave me like total freedom to do anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad that that it's not like that anymore, you know? And even they have to answer to Instagram and they have to answer to iTunes and YouTube and, you know, SoundCloud and everyone has to be friends and... Do you see a way through it? Do you see it? Um, do I see a way through it? Mm. Uh, I don't know, I feel like we need a little bit more time with this because, um, yeah, for me, I'm pushed out. You know, I've been pushed out for five years or something and I haven't been able to successfully release a record at all within the system and uh, or get my voice heard in terms of the Tamil plight. Yeah or get credit for anything I did, mm -hmm. you know, that that's been completely erased. And people know, but no one is kind of allowed to say it, you know. And so I think, um, yeah, for me, I have to find another way. Like, I don't see how I would, you know. In the film, there's this moment like the Super Bowl middle finger, I watched it. I didn't, it wasn't a thing to me. It's like, oh, whatever, that's what MI does. If you have MI on there, she's going to make a statement. That's fine. What w I didn't obviously get to see until I saw the film was after, in the aftermath, you were looking away and just said, what have I done? But you said it in a way like you genuinely were thinking, now what? Now what? That's how it looks watching the film back. Is that what it felt like then? Was that the beginning of this? Uh, no. No? No. I think the Maya record was the beginning, you know. Yeah. When Sri Lankans were on CNN talking about you, that's, yeah, that's when... Yeah, I think that's yeah. the beginning. Yeah, and the Sinhalese had, like, high-powered jobs in the government and, you know, in the US, and they all got green cards, and all the war criminals are not convicted. They still go there. They got mansions. Mm -hmm and none of them are questioned, they are in the UN, you know. That, that, that's like, that I'm the one who got censored and, you know, my visa taken away, my family got banned. My mum, the seamstress, yeah. she's seen as a threat to society and she's banned from America. But the guys who committed war crimes and killed thousands of people and raped loads of women and killed kids, have green cards, you know, and that's the truth. And and when I said that, that's when it started, right. you know, and it's before the NFL. Yeah. How do you get through that? Do we need that? Do we need those? Like, can you? You have songs, I'm assuming. You you would have you probably recorded a bunch of songs. Is that accurate? What do you mean? Like, do you have songs recorded? What now? Yeah. That you haven't released? Uh, no. There's no songs in the Maya library. No. Nah. <laughs> no. Are you telling me the truth? Is that the truth? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> maybe I've thought about a couple. <laughs> but no, I just, I, I, I feel like I'm thinking about it. And obviously my, my friend who I've taken on as my manager, he's been on for two months. Right. And he's like, you've got to write songs again. And my fans, they were like, at least write one new song for the documentary. So... I have been thinking about that, but obviously I'm not motivated to put it through the system. Right. There's just, why would I, you know? And um, 
yeah, I feel like everyone's like, don't worry, there's a changing of the guards and there's new people coming in and they're not going to do that to you. But they haven't got to that point where they're like, oh, we're going to talk about feminism, but we're also going to talk about what happens to a ethnic brown women in the music industry that is completely dominated by men who are like this, this and this. And this is how they've been treating me, you know. And that hasn't even, that, that's not a conversation that's being discussed. It's the Me Too you know. thing in Hollywood. Will I get to the music business? Yeah, I don't know, do you think? I don't know, I mean, I know the Kesha Dr. Luke thing was, was a big conversation. If that story came out today, as opposed to when it did, <clears throat> it might not have taken so long. I don't, I don't know. Um, I just assumed it would have already by now based on everything that how Hollywood was an avalanche. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I wasn't that close inside the music business to know if it was the same setup. Yeah, I think even if that happened, it still wouldn't include my situation because my mine's a bit messy because it is a bit political yeah. and, you know. And you're a woman of color, which, as and you know. Exactly. You're, you're not, it's, it's just not cut and dry, you know. Right. And... Do you yeah. feel frustrated, sad, ganged up upon? Like, well, how do you feel about No, this? that's just generally, generally, like, that's just where we've driven the culture. Like, you, they've made it, it's so, like, cookie cutter, you know. If you're this, you support that. If you're that, you support this. Are you with this? Are you with that? If you're not this, you're not that. And if you're against this, then you're with that. And, you know, it's all like, ugh, you know, and... I just generally don't exist like that, mm. you know. As you can see in my documentary, so many people are like um, part of that story. You know, you've got brown people, you've got war-torn people, you've got rich people, you've got Jewish people, you've got Muslim people, you've got da -da -da, you know. There's like that is is uh, you know. I can talk about how hip hop influenced me, and I can also talk about how Tamil music influenced me. Or I can talk about how the revolution influenced me or, you know, like it was just so varied. And the fact that that story can't exist now because like, I don't think I could make Hella now, you know, like. <clears throat> you could, but somebody coming up might not be able to. They can't because yeah. it would be considered politically incorrect right. to make such a happy, together, unified little, like, record, yeah. because it's, like, shocking, right. you know? And yeah, it, it would be dismissed, right? It'd be dismissed yeah. as, like, this is the most craziest controversial thing ever, you know? And it's kind of interesting because, like, that's just really unfortunate because even consumerism, if you take consumerism, it doesn't work like that. Like, everybody's obsessed about building global brands. It's like, oh, I want to sell shoes and I want to sell it all across the world. I want, to, I want to make Chinese people buy it. I want to make Indian people buy it. I want to make, you know, Russians buy it, the Americans buy it, da, da, da. you know, I want to sell it in Africa. Everybody thinks like that. Like, you're talking about getting your own Yeezys. Adidas thinks like that, mm -hmm. you know? Everybody who's working with sports brand thinks like that. So you want your consumers to be global, but you don't want the people around you to be global, you know, or you don't want global stuff coming back to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And very, it's, very protected, very sheltered group. Don't let them see what's happening out there. Yeah. And it's like that to me. Yeah. I don't want to fit into that because that's wrong anyway to begin with. Like, I see that as something wrong. Do you know what you want to do next? Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Steve's made this film, yeah. and it's like I'm a bit jealous because I wish I made a film because <laughs> I'm the one who was trying to be a documentary filmmaker. We still have 900 hours of when he's filming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Videos. So I'm like, hmm, gonna get that, Steve. <laughs> uh, so I'm waiting for Steve to hand me over the stuff, and then I might cut my own and you know make something more. I don't know. Wow. We'll see. Yeah, it, it'd be nice to like actually make something. Uh, yeah. Are you so you said you're, you quit music, but I don't want to believe you, so I won't. That's what, my own error. I mean, really, like seriously. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. I love music, you know. 
but I listen to a lot of old music now. Yeah. And real kind of like, you know, people actually like playing stuff and, and um, yeah, so it's kind of, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting my head around it. Like even that picture you wouldn't really be able to have in, in anywhere now because that would be seen as a controversial photo. What's interesting is so Canada has this, you know, this debate between the French and the English and back when there was this concept of separation from Quebec, that's a very unlikable um, FLQ member robbing a Canadian institution. That's the security camera photo from that. And even though I wanted to keep the country together, I respect that. This is a revolutionary in their own mind. So the photo it had to hang in my house. I couldn't be a revolutionary in my heart if I wouldn't let that hang. That's the yeah, guy that but I like disagreed if, with. If somebody saw that yeah. on, on your Instagram, yeah. they'd be like, oh my God. Oh, they know? do and they freak out. But I don't give a fuck anymore what people think. <laughs> that's it, I just don't care anymore. Like that, that's <laughs> all getting edited out. Yeah. So we're becoming so palatable and like, blah, you know. That's why it was really interesting screening the film to 16 year olds yesterday to be like, do you even like get it, you know? Like I'm surprised that you sat through a 90 minute long thing about one single subject. But they must have been into it. But they were into it, they were into it. But I'm curious to think which bit they were into, you know? But in Canada, people are a little bit more thoughtful, you know? They're not like, oh my God, what's it like working with Madonna? You know, which <laughs> is what I get all the time. Yeah, I forgot you did. Yes. Yeah, so. For me, it was like seeing a young Diplo. I was like, <laughs> holy fuck, people don't realize like Diplo became Diplo, but it's like, wow, that's really early on. That was more interesting to me than the Madonna stuff was. Like, that guy was a fucking kid too. It was just strange. I think people don't realize how much you've been a part of. Yeah. And that's what this film really shows them. You've kind of been connected to a lot of things they like now. And they don't want to give me credit. Well, you're going to get it here. That's good. Yeah, they only don't want to give it to you because you're a small brown woman. Is know? that why? And it's like... Or is it because you're also outspoken? If you were a white woman and you were outspoken, or a white man and outspoken, would you be getting this? Oh my God, I'd be getting awards left by the center. <laughs> I'd be getting like fucking Pulitzer Prizes, wouldn't I? You probably would. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll see. Cool, thank you.